Hi, I'm Jim Rumanier. I'm president of the Historical Society of Cheshire County. I'm here to talk about Roxbury, a lovely town where I've lived uh, since 1989. I expect that some people, if not many people, don't know much about Roxbury, including where it is, and that's understandable. It's one of the smallest towns around. And in terms of population, just 230 people. We've got uh, three paved roads, and one of them is paved only half the way. Two stop signs, no shops, no stores, no gas stations. But we have history, we have nature, we have water, we have good people there. Ultimately, what I'm going to be talking about today is not just a town, but the flow and currents of history. Introducing Roxbury, we'll be talking about where it is, its historical background, its natural setting, some distinguished people who've come from there, and also its waters. It's a small town in a small state. It's in red. Just to the left is the city of Keene. As to how you get there from where you are, well, you can approach it from Route 101 as it heads to Marlborough from Keene, or you can come straight out of Central Square in Keene, out Roxbury Street, and that will eventually bring you into the town itself, just 12 square miles. The dotted not, not lines there mark the two principal roads. You can see that the town is among many. In fact, in 1812, it was carved out of three of the communities that surrounded Marlborough, Nelson, which at the time was called Packersfield, and Keene. The name of the town, Roxbury. Many of the early settlers had uh, fought in the Revolutionary War and they were positioned, they were stationed in the town of Roxbury as part of a blockade of Boston Harbor. Uh, and so when they settled the town here, they brought their memories of that experience uh, to the incorporation. But there's another uh, explanation for the name, a bit whimsical, and that is, it is Roxbury. There are plenty of uh, uh, what are called uh, New Hampshire apples around, that is to say, stones, stones, and more stones. It's a proud town. Here's our pocket park that's at the four corners between Roxbury Street and Branch Road. In terms of population, there has been quite a bit of change. At the first federal census in 1820, look at all the people who were there. That was the time of the sheep boom. And as the sheep boom dissipated and failed, then other things occurred that changed the population structure of Roxbury, including the introduction of the railroad, which opened up the Midwest to people who really wanted good farmland to work. The Civil War, it took many members of the community. And then the general decline of rural areas that is known in northern New England as the abandonment, or as the great abandonment. It was at the end of the 19th century when the state government tried to reverse that trend and began encouraging the holding of old home days to bring people back. I'm not sure if Roxbury had an old home days, but eventually, after it reached its nadir in terms of population, which would have been in the early part of the 20th century, the invention of the automobile changed its fortunes the town became a bedroom community for people who had jobs elsewhere. We have a respect for history. Here is the town hall that was uh, at the old town center in the geographic center of town. When that particular building lost its use as people moved away, one part of the building was saved. That was the tower atop the, uh, the church, or the meeting house as it was also called. And the tower was kept on property of a local resident. And I have talked with a fellow who grew up on that property and who used the tower as a playhouse. Well, in, eight, in 2012, when Roxbury was preparing to celebrate its 200th birthday, a thought was given to take the tower, which no longer even was being used as a playhouse, and plant it on top of the existing town hall. Here's what the town hall looked like before the change. And here, after the change, the tower lives on. There's history for you.
It's a woodsy town. This is Middletown Road, the road on which I live. And the community is rich with wilderness. It's also a habitat for many. Bobcat, coyotes, deer, owls, and other bird life, porcupines for your rambling dog to catch, bear, they walk right up our driveway, turkeys, flocks and flocks and flocks of wild turkeys, fox, woodpeckers whose sound echoes through the forest, beavers, and of course moose. The community is not just about wild animals, it's about people who settled there. There are homes that were built and were maintained over what now is the centuries, elegant places. And now something about the folks who lived in the community. Bree Batchelder is uh, actually arrived, his time was before the town was incorporated. He was a, a, a Massachusetts man who moved to uh, the area, then known as Packersfield, now known as Nelson, in, uh, in, sub in the 1760s. And as a land surveyor, he became quite wealthy as an owner of quite a bit of land. And like more than a few other people who had done well during the English period, the English colonial period, Mr. Batchelder was not at all interested in the having things change. Therefore, he resisted the uh, calls to join in on the revolutionary cause. Well, at a certain point, tensions developed. He was outspoken, and uh, people deeply resented his feelings. They came looking for him, and he hid out in a cave up the road from where I live, and lived there for three months. Ultimately, the vigilante group uh, found out where he was and headed for him. He fled over Pinnacle Mountain and wound up during the Revolutionary War fighting in the British Army. He fought in the Battle of Saratoga and in the Battle of Bennington, where by coincidence he was wounded by a man from the very town where he had lived. Like uh, many other Tory sympathizers, he wound up living in Nova Scotia where, due to a boating accident in the late uh, 18th century, he drowned. He's another, another famous figure who spent time in Roxbury in the 1820s, Salmon P. Chase. His association with the town was as a 15-year-old boy, he was asked to be a teacher, fill in as a teacher at a schoolhouse in town. His service lasted exactly two weeks. He was a small man, a small boy actually, who was smaller than some of his students who apparently took uh, umbrage at him. They lifted him out of the classroom and threw him in the snow. He was dismissed from service as a teacher and wound up doing well for himself. He spent the rest of many of his, rest of his years in Ohio where he was an elected senator, he was governor, Ultimately, he joined the uh, administration of Abraham Lincoln, where he was named Treasury Secretary, and that explains why his picture is on the $10,000 bill. For anybody who has one of those at home, that's Sam and Pete Chase right there. He went on to become uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Isaac Woodward, we don't have a picture of him, but we have a picture of his products. He was a carpenter, who, a furniture maker, who moved to Boston at a young age, associated himself with a, uh, another man, and they formed a piano company, and they produced some of the highest-end pianos that were available in the country at that time. Joseph Ames, portrait painter, painter self-taught, also from Roxbury, moved to Boston, gained a name for himself, a significant name, so much so that he was invited to Rome, where he painted Pope Pius IX, and he painted other significant figures in the United States, and portraits hang all over the place. His brother, Nathan, much younger, also moved to Boston, where he was educated at Harvard, became a lawyer, he became a patent attorney. And one of his greatest distinctions was inventing, making some inventions of his own. He was the inventor of the first escalator, patent number 26,076, revolving stairs, they were called. He designed the product for invalids to help them up and down stairs. 
At that time in history, the Patent Office did not require working models, which is just as well, because he was never able to determine a power source for them. The uh, first escalator didn't actually get to operate until 1899, long after he had died at a young age. It was at Coney Island, and it was presented as, a, as an amusement ride. Cyrus Wakefield, the last of our distinctive members of the community, moved to Boston, also at a young age, and worked at a grocery. And while there, he found himself on the docks. He noticed the wrappings that so many importers and exporters had used to protect their goods, whatever the goods were, during transit. And he began to become a jobber of this wrapping, which was really, it was made from a distinctive kind of palm leaf known as rattan. He wound up creating a company that became one of the largest uh, furniture, rattan furniture makers in the United States. At the time that he died in the uh, late uh, 19th century, uh, his company in South Reading, Massachusetts, employed more than a thousand people. And as an honor to him, the town of South Reading changed its name to Wakefield. It's now Wakefield, Massachusetts. Now on to some of the industry that exists in town today. Granite Gorge Ski Area. This is on Route 9 on the way to Concord. This initially was a ski area formed in the late 1960s known as Pinnacle Mountain. That service lasted for about a decade. And then in lay dormant for a couple of decades, and then in 2003, the Babbitt construction family in Keene acquired the property and began its conversion into a much more active ski area. There is also Nye Hill Farm. A relatively recent innovation there was the introduction of a brewery, and they've done quite well there at a recent uh, brew fest put on by the Historical Society of Cheshire County at the Wyman Tavern in Keene. The Nye Hill Farm won all the top prizes for its beers. Going back a bit, Roxbury had a name for itself in granite mining. There were three significant quarries there, all surface mines. And the production was so significant and so valued that a rail spur line was built into Roxbury to carry product all over the place. The, some of the principal uh, buildings in New York State Capitol, Albany, were made from granite that was mined in Roxbury. There are some lo local applications of that granite, for example. The base of the Civil War statue in Central Square in Keene is made from Roxbury granite. As is the handsome railroad bridge across the uh, north branch of the Ashwila River um, in South Keene, and as this is this absolutely beautiful uh, arched uh, culvert uh, beneath an embankment that carried rail line out of Roxbury, taking uh, the granite to markets far beyond. That particular image is significant here because it was built to carry water from that, that was flowing out of Roxbury toward ultimately the Connecticut River. So here we have a picture of Roxbury with its significant water bodies, Woodard Pond in the upper right, and Badger Reservoir to the lower left. Those are the source of most of Keene's drinking water. Then to the left, Otter Brook Lake, which is a federal flight control lake. Lower right is Spectacle Pond. It is used not for any flight control or supply issue, but it is one of the larger bodies of water. We're going to be talking about two different uh, varieties of uh, these larger bodies of waters. One is Otterbrook Lake, and then also Babbage Reservoir and Woodard Pond. They're grouped together because they're part of the same water supply system. Otterbrook Lake is for flood control. Babbage Reservoir and Woodard Pond are for water supply. The flood control dam. This project was built in 1958 and has quite a bit of history behind it. In the early 1930s, one of his first acts, during his first 100 days in office, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Tennessee Valley Authority Act, <clears throat> which, as a, uh, a way to fight the, the Depression, uh, established the construction of a um, multitude of dams 
for uh, flood control and also hydroelectric production uh, in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, in the late 1930s, the president attempted to <clears throat> establish a similar network of federal flood control and uh, electricity producing dams in northern New England, specifically on the Connecticut River and its tributaries. <clears throat> Otter Brook, which flows through Roxbury, was one of those tributaries which leads to the Ashwelet, which leads to the Connecticut. The president had hoped that there'd be a significant uh, warming to his idea in northern New England, and that he was entirely wrong. His initial plan called for 30 or so, sometimes people said 50 or so, and some proposed more than that, even 100 flood control dams by the federal government in New Hampshire and in Vermont. A significant point here is that northern New England had been developed long before many other parts of the country, and all the property was in private hands. It wasn't federal land that could be easily used for any purpose whatsoever. And the, 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 the people in govern government at that time were small government folks who resisted federal intrusion. The, when, Fra when Franklin Roosevelt proposed building all these dams up here, the uh, Vermont legislature in 1939 raised $67,000 to fight federal intrusion into northern New England. The governor of New Hampshire at the time, Francis Murphy, threatened to call out the National Guard if a single federal authority official came looking to buy land in, the, in New Hampshire. Ultimately, World War II came along and distracted uh, the, the government and the public's attention to other more important issues. And so the whole idea of building all these flood, federal flood control dams up in uh, northern New England faded away. It took until 1958 for this one to be built, and ultimately it was one of only 13 federal flood control dams out of the original lot that Franklin Roosevelt had hoped for, none equipped with electricity producing capacity. And some people lament that fact today, saying, you know, if these dams had been built with uh, hydro, then New Hampshire and other parts of northern New England would not be so dependent on imported energy. Nevertheless, that's the history we have today. People in Roxbury resisted the idea of the dam being built. There were farms down there, after all. But since the stream and the uh, stream uh, forms a border that divides both Keene and Roxbury, folks in Keene had different ideas, and their ideas apparently held sway. The federal government, in an effort to sweeten the pot, as it were, offered to build a swimming area up at the uh, northern end of Otterbrook Lake. Keene, the city of Keene at that time, had no public swimming pools and it had been reduced to busing its children to Troy and other places to get their swimming in during the summer. Here was a way that they could get their swimming in in Keene itself. The dam was built. Now onto the water supply lands and ponds. There's Woodard Pond. Here's a group of Keene city officials in the early part of the 20th century. And they're standing on the dam at Woodard Pond. Woodard Pond uh, was acquired as a, as a water supply source in 1886. The city of Keene had suffered a significant fire in uh, 1865 and had responded by building a couple of reservoirs in the city of Keene. But eventually, the uh, growth of the community, plus uh, the growth of manufacturing in, in the city of Keene, plus the introduction of indoor plumbing, had led to rising consumption of water. So to find water that they could had easily, city officials went into Roxbury at a higher elevation from Keene where they bought the land, dam increased the size of the dam, and piped the water down into a valley and then up into Keene. Uh, and that lasted them for uh, until the 1930s when in fact a different reservoir or supplementary water source was developed in the construction of Babbage Reservoir. Here's a picture of it today. The name owes itself, Babbage that is, the name owes itself to Paul Babbage, who for 50 years, between 1888 and 1938, was the Keene Superintendent of Water, Sewers, and Drains. There's a title for you. This is not his work uniform right here. This is something else, but I couldn't help but 
use this photo here and the one you're next going to see. In uh, 1898, uh, Mr. Babbage, then Captain Babbage in the Keene Light Guard, led a deployment of 110 volunteers toward uh, Cuba, that is to say, toward the Spanish-American War. They never made it all the way there. The war ended uh, early, earlier than they had thought. They spent a couple of months in uh, camps uh, in the uh, southeast, and there, uh, the, the Mr. Babbage learned with his saw with his own eyes the polluting effects of of uh, bad water on people. Uh, the Spanish-American War was the last war in which America was involved, in which more people died from disease than from combat, and much of that disease resulted from illnesses that were carried by fetid water. In any case, this next picture, which I had to bring, is <coughs> shot in a veterans parade in 1911. That's downtown Keene. What a delightful sight. Well, this acquisition of water properties in Roxbury led to the conservation of land there. Here we have Roxbury and the land that is owned by the city of Keene that was purchased between 1886 and actually the last purchase was made in the 1950s. But the city says it remains open to buying other land to protect the watershed uh, if that land becomes available. The argument being here that it's cheaper to keep pollution out of drinking water than it is to remove pollution from drinking water. So the more control you have over the watershed, the, the safer the water will be. So there's about 3,000 acres of land that's preserved, part of the reason that Roxbury is such a green town. Here's another reason. The Federal Flight Control Dam on the left there. That's all conserved land also to protect the watershed of the flight control dam. And finally, here's where private individuals began donating their land to the cause of conservation. So you can see how much of Roxbury is preserved an explanation as to why it's so green. It's divided by green. I'm showing three circles here. There's the administrative center of Roxbury today. Here's a part in the northwest. Here's a part in the east. Excuse me, part of Nelson's in the northeast. This one's in the east here. I put these here because all the land that's preserved between these dots is green land that, cannot, that, that doesn't support a road. So for folks in the upper right to get to the administrative center of Roxbury, they have to drive to Sullivan, then through Keene to get to the administrative center. Likewise, the people who live in uh, the uh, circle on the lower right to get to the administrative center, they've got to drive through Marlboro and then the city of Keene. And to my knowledge, it's the only community where people have to leave town, go through two other towns so they could get to town hall for their meetings. Which is important. It's, one, it's hard to keep a town unified when you've got people living in all these different areas. So there's one, uh, one small solution to that is that at an annual town meeting in Roxbury, uh, the folks put on a potluck sucker. It's supper. It's, to my knowledge, one of the very few towns that has a potluck sucker, pot supper where all the folks who are members, representatives of the town can gather together and have a meal before they sit down and start arguing with each other over budgets. The watershed that I've just cited has got protections on it. People are encouraged to keep it clean. The sign here is pretty restrictive. It's posted very hot. You may not be able to read the lettering on it, which is just as well. The reason that the sign is posted so high, that is say higher than I can reach or anybody else can reach, could be an indication as to what city officials think would happen to the signs if we're closer, closer to the ground. There is bad behavior up there in the watershed. Just uh, recently my wife and I were out walking. Here's something we brought home. And here's something we saw on one of the trails. Mud boggers are up there having a delightful time ruining the trails and ultimately sending sediment uh, washing by runoff into the reservoirs. I wanted to mention two specific examples of uh, uh, illustrations of uh, uh, human
behavior in the watershed that has a kind of a natural feel to it. This is Babbage Reservoir in ice. You can notice a pine tree up on the far left there. If you were to go out there today, and you can walk out there despite the signs, you see that the reservoir is surrounded entirely by trees. It's a, it's a 40 acre body of water. And all the trees around it are pine trees. No maples, no birch, no oak. Why? Well, to protect the reservoir waters from having deciduous leaves, leaves fall them in the fall, and then wind up coloring the water and having the water wind up tasting like fish. Well, the city of Keene, when it built that reservoir in 1931, it cleared the whole landscape around it and planted thousands of white pine trees around them. The pines keep their needles on all winter long. They don't lose their needles or leaves. And so they help catch water as it, flow, as, it, as it falls from the sky and prevents water from falling onto the ground and rushing and carrying a runoff, possibly polluting runoff, into the reservoir itself. Here's another case of the hand of man in nature. This one is not exactly intended. Here, if you, go to, if you were to go to a Woodard Pond in the northern part of the community, you'd find some beautiful stands of mountain wood. It's absolutely, it's a beautiful plant. Horticulturalists for centuries have valued these. The early ones would send, it's native to North America, they would send samples back to uh, fancy gardens in Britain. Now why would there be fancy mountain laurel blooming beautifully in the summer on the shores of a reservoir? Well, nobody, no human planted them there by design. What humans did do to protect the water supply from falling leaves and other stuff flowing into the water is they cut back trees far away from the shoreline, allowing sunlight to flow in. And sunlight then, uh, then gave uh, a wonderful habitat for bushes, shrubs that, were, that just were naturally growing. You'll find quite a few blueberry bushes up there too. Not exactly a design, but that's what happened. It is of note that mountain laurel, for all their beauty, is poisonous to animals. That's why it's called, in some parts of the country, sheep kill. As to why the city of Keene would be happy to have a plant that's called sheep kill on the shores of his drinking water supply, well, not to worry. There is a saying by hydrologists that helps explain that perhaps it's not all that dangerous if a leaf or two were to fall into the reservoir, which is the solution to pollution is dilution. And dilution indeed is what happens when a leaf or two would fall into a reservoir of 140 acres. Not to worry. The hand of man is reflected in other ways through water power and conserving water in Roxbury. Here are a couple of examples. Water power, Roaring Brook, which is the stream that connects Woodard Pond and Babbage Reservoir in Roxbury, had in the 19th century had three mills on it, all of them small. Here's what one might have looked like. And here is the Holman Dam, still standing there. The works of the mill are long gone, but the dam still stands. Here's a picture of the kind of up and down saw that would have been used at the first mill in Roxbury on Roaring Brook at the Woodward Mill. I want to contrast this to a different kind of technology, water power technology, that was installed almost precisely 200 years after this one was used. Here's a, here it is right here. This particular operation here is in the Keene Water Treatment Plant, which draws in a roughly 1,200 gallons a minute from uh, Roxbury's water supply. This particular instrument was installed in 2011. The, uh, it's, a, it's a modern hydro operation that generates hydro inside a pipe, in, in fact, inside the valves of a pipe that lead water in from the reservoir and moving on to the city of Keene, to the people, factories that are there. Um, the installation occurred in 2011, and so far as we know, was the first such case where a, a water treatment plant in the United States is, produces all the electricity it needs, all within its own operation. 
then they're a matter of conserving water. I'm going to offer a little test here. I'm going to guess a technology that has saved Keene countless millions of dollars over the years. Give a thought to it. What kind of technology could that be? Well, let's take a look. There it is, the lowly toilet. In 1992, the uh, first President Bush passed the Energy Policy Act that, among other things, called for, called for the expansion of subsidies for alternative energies and the like, but it also contained a provision that called for the mandatory use of uh, low-flow uh, faucets and other household appliances uh, in, in homes and businesses. And the point of it is that it takes energy to treat water that we drink. And if you can do anything that would reduce the amount of water that we need to treat, then that reduces the energy we expend in the treatment process. Uh, this was significant information for the region here because in the, 18, in the 1980s, Keene was worried that it was going to run out of water. And it engaged an engineering company to find a supplementary source of water, and it did on Otter Brook, which is the other major uh, stream that flows through Roxbury. And the engineering company came up with a design to take water from the brook, pump it up the hill, mix it with water coming from Roaring Brook's reservoirs. And that would meet the needs, the growing needs, of the, of, of the community of Keene. But that uh, in, in, installation was never made. It didn't have to be made because once the Energy Policy Act of 1992 was passed, energy, uh, water consumption in Keene flattened out and began to decline. In fact, here it is right here. With the, with, with the low flow toilets, one flush is 1.8 gallons. Old toilets, one flush is 3.5 gallons. So you can see that this particular innovation, as fancy or as lowly as it may seem, really had a significant impact on water cons consumption coming out of Roxbury. Well, we're back to where it all began, back to the waters of Roxbury. We've learned a couple things here today. Its waters have meant a lot to a lot of people outside of Roxbury, especially Keene. They've also meant a lot to Roxbury, too, only in a different way. Much of Roxbury's lands are protected because of those waters, giving the town the rural and wooded character that defines it. The waters of Roxbury. Thank you very much. Any questions?